starting off this morning with Nate Hayden. Uh, Nate is coming to us from AOL where he is a master of content. So we've, we've got a little discussion planned and we'll, we'll definitely have some time so, for Q&A. So uh, hang in there and, and welcome Nate to the stage. Sorry. Thank you. I'm bummed that I missed the uh, beer massage yesterday. Yeah. I, was well, it simultaneous? Me, Mike Margolin and I were talking about this, and we thought, beer massage together, this is <laughs> awesome. And I couldn't figure out how you could do it without a really long straw. And turns out, you really kind of had to pick beer and massage, because there was a, a lot going on there. I like a little of both. Um, so Nate, mm -hmm. we are happy to have you here today. Glad to be here. Um, it's a, a good time. AOL, obviously, is a huge player in the video space. The um, you know, we talked yesterday in some of the groups, we've got Google and Facebook here, mm -hmm. big, big video players. AOL's third biggest brand in the world with yep. video, obviously been in the business for as long as anybody. Mm -hmm. um, AOL, how many people here, AOL was your first email address and your first internet connection? Or still is your email address. <laughs> There's a lot of people still using it's it. It's very true, my grandmother's one of them. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm not making any of the <laughs> grandmother AOL jokes. It's not gonna happen. I know, it's me, leave it um, to me. So anyway, your title is Vice President of Originals and Branded Entertainment. Um, how do you see splitting your time there? One of the things I want to get up front, Nate is the, not the deal guy. He's the content guy. He's the content producer guy. The crazy creative. We were right, talking right. about this yesterday with the idea of, you know, how do you engage with these people and all these things? And, and Nate is the content guy, but there's obviously a whole team of people working yeah. on on making deals with the people in this room. Right, 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 right. Um, I mean, as far as how I split my time, like the, the thing that I, what's been great about the role that I've taken on now is not only do we have a fantastic slate of originals that are all completely deficit financed and we really can kind of play in that space, we also have our branded entertainment piece that is, it's the same team. There, it's really, it's two pieces of, of this, this ecosystem that we can create this great kind of original uh, docu content and then have that same voice to go over into our branded stuff. Um, and I think as far as my role there, it, it kind of speaks perfectly to my experience, not to toot my own horn, but having come from both production um, and production studios as well as a network, I kind of get to wear both hats in this. From the branded side, we really do kind of act as a production company. And so we're sitting down with agencies and we're sitting down with brands and we're really finding like, What's, what's the touch points here? What's the voice that you want to have? And what messages do you want to get across? And then custom creating content for that in the same voice that we produce and direct our original stuff. So I can switch from at one point really kind of feeling like the network on the original side and really thinking from the network and building that voice and then be a production company on the other side of it. Mm -hmm. So it's, I think it's a, it's a great 50-50 split and it engages with two of the things that I love very, very much. So. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. Yesterday we were talking about with all of the channels that are now available, there's so much content. There's so many channels. Brands can't afford to produce all that stuff. Right. We can't get out there and create content for all these different places. We also, in a lot of cases, aren't prepared to develop content that is going to be interesting enough yeah. for people to want to view it and to share it. So the idea of these branded integrations um, really works out well. Well, and it's also a way, like I said, to do, we can do very celeb-driven passion projects on right. the original side, and that is something that, that th with those passion projects, those high-level celebs from Steve Buscemi to um, James Franco, they are so passionate about those projects, yeah. and we can let them engage on that side, and then really keep that same voice and translate that over into the branded stuff, so. So you've got a long history in, in production, working with Mark Burnett, yep. VH1, MTV, producing um, and creating content all these places. How is it different being at AOL, being at a digital brand, uh, who, who, by the way, does have broadcast properties too, uh, mm -hmm. obviously, but how is it different from, from your experience with the broadcast production companies? Well, I mean, actually, it's the thing that's been great about digital is it, we, can kind of, we can kind of push the boundaries a little bit. We can be a little bit louder. We can be a little bit edgier. Um, the kind of almost the expectation for uh, for what good digital docu uh, docu content now is is bigger and broader, and the expectations are higher. Um, so, so it's not all going to be Hulk Hogan's Celebrity Championship Wrestling, which was one of my favorite shows that I've worked on. It's in my notes. It is in your notes. Yeah. So yeah. Um, but yeah, I do think that it is. We actually the expectation is broader than, and we're doing a lot of things that couldn't be done on network TV right now. 
which is kind of cool. Yeah, Hulk Hogan Celebrity <laughs> Championship Wrestling, Smash Lab, right. Living Lahaina. Yep. You just wanted to go production and Who Maui, doesn't? obviously. Come I mean, on. <laughs> every creative guy comes up with a spot that has to be shot in Maui. Somehow some point, has to be so shot in Maui. It's not surprising. Yep. Um, Battleground Earth, uh -huh. Amnesia, ton of stuff. Yeah, and, and MTV was actually, I was at MTV for about seven years, and that was really kind of where I honed the docu chops. Like, we started off doing music documentary, we started off doing kind of uh, follow docs there that were truly me and a camera just kind of tracking with a band and shooting full docu content. And so this does feel like kind of a great return to a docu voice, um, which has been great. Uh, are you primarily gonna stick with the non-scripted world? Yeah, I think that, to be totally honest, that, that feels like the one thing that's a void, or, or a vacuum right now. I mean, you've got, as far as digital, um, Vice is doing a very gritty form of docu, unscripted. Um, you've got vloggers and MCNs and YouTubers that are doing this extremely accessible but very kind of lo-fi kind of unscripted content, and then there is really great scripted being done. So I can say that we're probably not gonna touch scripted because there is so much good stuff to be done kind yeah. of in that premium unscripted space that's just not being done in digital. And so we can, we can kind of elevate, and I almost have been calling it like a post-reality. Um, reality TV as it exists on uh, traditional broadcast has really kind of reached its, I don't know if zenith is the right word, maybe it just fell off of a cliff, but, um, so there is this vacuum and this void for what can be done in the unscripted space. Right. And to be able to explore that on digital, I think is, is, there's a lot more to be done in it. And to be honest too, we are already kind of dipping our toes into alternative ways to do unscripted. Um, Steve Buscemi's park bench is truly a guy sitting down and doing interviews on a park bench in New York. What he's able to do though is he's also doing kind of almost a soft scripted kind of curb your enthusiasm um, connective material within that show. So that really kind of is starting to feel a little bit hybrid, um, but at its core is a very unscripted concept. And then James Franco's making a scene, which is one of my favorite things that we did this year. He, we really let him loose on that project. That was a full on passion project for him. And it is him reenacting some of his favorite scenes from, from movies, like classic favorite scenes, but doing them with an insane twist. And a lot of times he's playing himself. We have one where Titanic, he does uh, Wayne's World meets Titanic, and he plays both the Wayne and Garth character as it's Leo doing his uh, sketch of um, Kate Winslet. So it's really um, <coughs> very true to the original form. Um, but so that's another, that's another way that we're taking kind of this unscripted stuff, but still it's, it is scripted at its core, but doing it in unique ways. So that's my long answer for saying that we're not gonna do scripted anytime soon because it's being done so well, but we have so many cool things to do in the unscripted space that there's a lot to play with. I like long answers. <laughs> More of you, less of me is good for everyone. Um, I don't know about that. I, I think one of the things that is interesting though, you talked a little bit about this, mm -hmm. so like, it's a little bit like reality TV has kind of jumped the shark a little yeah. bit at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, but it also feels like we're kind of, you know, we kind of went crazy with it and now maybe it's coming back. We were talking earlier, Lisa Herdman, who's, by the way, the only person at the front table. Thank you, Lisa. <laughs> She's very nice if anyone would like to sit with her. But she, uh, she and I worked on a project when I first came to RPA in 1993 mm -hmm. uh, called Fairway to Heaven, which was a VH1 yes. production that uh -huh. involved golf and rock stars. And it was kind of an early, early, idea of VH1 was really one of the early mm -hmm. players in that space in MTV and then we ended up working with uh, Mark Burnett on a show called Road Rules which I still believe was the first real major reality show. Might have been the real world I'm just saying. Real world yeah Possibly. It, it was a lot. Road Rules was pretty fun though <laughs> but I, I think one of the things that's interesting about those is mm -hmm. that when it first happened when we first did those there was all this fear about oh my god you're gonna put brands right. into these things mm -hmm. people are gonna reject it they're right. gonna be so upset they're gonna be bothered by it and now it feels like something that we found a good balance in. It seems like the industry is getting better at figuring out how to take product placements and, yeah. and branded sponsorships and make them feel a little more authentic. 100%, and I think that we see that in, from our originals across into our branded entertainment. And I think one of the things that's cool about, again, like I said, having it all kind of in the same house is that we do have a full spectrum. We have stuff that is our originals that we can do 
we can find ways to do um, integrations that are essentially off-camera integrations for our originals and be that um, presented by bumps in. We can integrate um, logos and color schemes into the graphics for a show. We can also do, we, with our content, have a, uh, a number of ancillary pieces of content, and so that's another place that we can bring that we can bring branding into the originals. And then as we continue on the other side of the spectrum, we can go into our truly branded entertainment. And those, even within that, we have stuff that is essentially no brand integration, just messaging um, within the content. And then we have stuff that can be essentially almost advertising. Um, so full spectrum across the entire suite of stuff that we've got. Um, I think I've got a couple of clips that we could potentially show. Was this? The best part. So two examples here. One that's a very kind of light, super light integration, and more just really just um, kind of logo integration, um, and one that is um, much heavier integration. So we'll take a look, and then we can talk afterwards, kind of how those came about. Okay. Can we see those? My name is Joe, and I help people by cutting hair. Right now, I'm official barber to all the homeless people and poor people at Hartford. I am not a barber. I have a BS in accounting. I was in business with my father and it was lucrative, but I got a chance to pay back a little bit to the community. The way I got started is 26 years ago. I volunteered with the Red Cross for their caravan program at Immaculate Conception Shelter. One day there was a young man named Arnold, and I said to Arnold, I said, gee, Arnold, not only are you a bum, you look like a bum. How about if I bring in my clippers and clean you up a little bit? So the next week I brought my clippers in and I gave Arnold a haircut. How much do you charge for a haircut? I said, you only get a hug. Almost immediately, it became the, the hug for a haircut barbershop. Look at that nice curly hair. Nice. When I'm sitting in that chair, I feel like my life is in Joe's hands. Joe's going to make sure when I get out of that chair, I didn't look like I looked when I got in. Joe gives me confidence. Lots of confidence. You can go ahead and do that. Veronica Belmont, tech aficionado, social networking fanatic, and your host for today's exciting unboxing live stream. What's inside this huge box beside me has a 4G LTE connection, more powerful than a smartphone, and allows you to connect up to seven devices to it. It's going to revolutionize how we connect with each other and give you the freedom to connect almost anywhere. Today we're going to dive into how this product works and connect with people across the United States. Plus, stay tuned as we give away prizes throughout the show. Now let's see what's in this box. <gasps> wow! It's a 2015 Chevrolet Malibu connected by OnStar with 4G LTE. I bet you didn't see that coming. So you can see those are kind of the full full spectrum there. Right. And it's we and as far as how each of those came about, we we sit down at the very early stages with agency or, or brand more likely, more than likely agency most of the time, and really kind of define what are our touch points here. Like what do we want to hit? What's the message we want to get across? And and across kind of that spectrum, what are how can we manage getting a message across while also being cognizant of content, and so that you don't get to a point where you lose your message because, yeah. because it's so oppressive. Um, Unboxing was a good example of kind of a massive campaign. You saw there was pieces in there that were kind of referenced. We did event marketing tied in with a big social campaign with that one, a huge live event that was broadcast, I think, from at least four different locations, music performances, and all the way through, it really was heavily integrated. And so you're seeing a car, and you're seeing products, and you're seeing how the, all those things interact with each other. Um, and then the State Farm piece, I mean, almost in essence could have been just as is that video kind of can could have right. been one of our originals. Right. So it really is, and I think one of the things that, that, we, that we stress and we really like is being fully transparent from the very beginning and having those conversations with agency, with brand, to say, 
here's, here's exactly what we want, and, and really everybody being on the same page from the get-go, and I think it was being talked about before, like making sure those conversations happen early, and I think everybody wants to be early in the conversation, and I think that only makes for better content, and I think we, we as a creator want to make sure that we balance message, mm -hmm. um, or, or balance content and message, and I think brands, of course, want to make, I, we just want to make sure that we're honest from the get-go as far as what are the actual messages we want to get across. It's interesting you talk about, um, obviously in the Chevrolet case, they came to you looking for something very specific yeah. and wanted to uh, find a good vehicle for it. Mm -hmm. Bad pun, not, not intended. <laughs> um, I think the, the idea of it, though, is somebody having a specific need and coming to you. Right. I think one of the things that we see a lot on the agency side is there are content producers, there are publishers who have a good show, who have a property, and they're looking for a sponsor or someone to integrate. How, how often is it, is it starting with you versus starting from a brand? Um, I mean, I think it's probably, it's 50-50. There's a lot of times that we, I mean, we have a massive distribution network. We have tens right. of thousands of of uh, partner sites that our content is pushed out to, which is a massive marketing piece that we just have built into us. And again, I think that's a very attractive piece as well as our O and O's um, as well. So, so it, it is it is fifty fifty. We get we get RFPs constantly. Um, we we then have a huge slate of content that we can either match up with or custom create. And so it's uh, there's there again there's just a lot of a lot of different models for how we're working at this point. Um, and I know you're not the deal guy, but is, oh, the, is, the, is the content that's produced that way, mm -hmm. um, is the production cost rolled into the media buy? It's is rolled it just, into the overall deal. It is. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Um, we, we've definitely seen it both ways, so it's yeah. interesting. So one of the things we wanted to talk about, and you touched on it a little bit, this mm -hmm. idea of all of the Hollywood talent that is making their way to these yeah. online projects. And a lot of it is, I think, people taking advantage of the passion projects mm -hmm. and really going after, you know, you can do a show for the long tail that talks to a certain audience that won't offend this audience because it's not on a network and yeah. people are choosing to be there and watching it. But, I mean, Steve Buscemi, Sarah Jessica Parker, Zoe Saldana, uh, James Franco, Ellen DeGeneres, Kevin mm -hmm. Nealon, Mike Epps, mm -hmm. all these guys, yeah. people like you, the, pr the production side, are we coming to that point where original content online is really going to compete with the things that we watch from broadcast that we watch online yeah. too? I mean, I think obviously with what's going on with Netflix and, and AOL mm -hmm. and other developers, there's so much good production now that yeah. is originating for digital. Yeah, I think it's a really interesting time and it's been, there is no, no lack of people stating the obvious that it is, there is starting to be this merger and there's starting to be, um, what I think is interesting is we did, um, we're going now into our second season of Candelina Nicole, which was transitioned over to TV and that used to be something we did and we trumpeted that as a, as a massive success and I think the interesting thing is gonna be like at the point which that is not necessarily even something that's trumpeted as a big success, that is really, there is this merger of it and I think that, the other thing that I think is interesting is that, yeah, we've, we bring major Hollywood talent to our shows to kind of cut above the, get us a cut above the digital clutter um, in, a, in a certain sense, and, and in the reality, in the docu-space, be um, kind of not competing with the Netflixes and the big Kevin Spacey projects, but really just to kind of be on that same field, and it's done a great job of elevating that docu-stuff. But I think there's, a, along with this merger, you've got the MCN talent, the YouTubers that are premiuming pre themselves as well. And right. you've got Maker that is essentially at some point going to start leveraging Disney IP with, the, with their um, YouTube <coughs> celebs. And so there is this crazy kind of evening of the, of the platform and everyone is kind of getting into a space where it, again, it's an overused term, but screen agnostic, and I think that there is just going to be various flavors of content, which it's extremely exciting from a storyteller's perspective because there is just so much to play in. There's right. so much cool stuff to do, um, but I, I would assume that then from like a buyer standpoint, it just gets a little confusing because there is so much stuff to choose from, and it is kind of like where is my where is my best platform. Yeah, it's interesting with all the celebrities that are making the move over, though, because I think one of the things we touched on a little bit yesterday is this whole idea of borrowed interest being important. When mm -hmm. you are not pushing and broadcasting and publishing to people, how do they find this content? What right. is getting them there? 
um, is, a, is a brand that creates something responsible to drive all that traffic and promote it, or is their traffic coming? AOL's got a lot of opportunity yeah. to, to promote within its network. Mm -hmm. But I think one of the things that you get when you have a celebrity is they have followings. Yeah. They have people searching for them. It's, it's one of the things I kind of laughed about yesterday. We have for years tried to figure out how to make people care about cars and insurance and those things, and the Clippers <laughs> are really going to be fun because people care about the Clippers. Yeah. So they're following, they're dying for right. those feeds. So mm -hmm. I think the celebrities really do give you a, a leg up in that kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that one thing from both the original creation and also into our branded creation, it's something that we have had these conversations with brands and with agencies that we find the talent that already has that built-in massive social following. Yep. And I think that that's become paramount or tantamount with celebrity as well. So it's like we find people who have this built-in following, and to be honest, we, we all are aware it's, that's the, its own marketing arm in and of itself. And it is, it's something that we absolutely look for on the branded side because you may have a celeb talent whose passion project is something that's so, um, they're so protective of and not necessarily open to being integrated into a passion project, mm -hmm. But then if you can find a, um, a, someone for a branded program that has such a massive social following, you kind of get the same bang for the buck. And it's funny, going the other way, there's all these new celebrities that are actually being created from a YouTube channel right. or uh, someone who's teaching people how to put on makeup or someone yeah. who dances or someone who does cover yeah. songs. There's all these celebrities now that people are reaching out to and saying, well, you've got 16 million followers maybe I could sort of, you know, they And they in. are monetizing in such, like they have learned how to monetize themselves right. at this point. And they've become their own industry in and of themselves. And it is really fascinating to go to them from a creator standpoint and say, hey, listen, we'd like to involve you in a project or, or for you to be a part of a project. And they are their own little brands themselves. They know, yep. they know their worth, they know their value. And it is funny kind of to, to be on the, on the ground with that and have some people who are, I mean, they're still a kid from Nebraska and they're excited to be at the party, or then there's the guys who know, listen, I get $10,000 per tweet. So it's an interesting, that's an interesting evolving business in and of itself. How do you get to be the guy that makes $10,000 a tweet? Because <laughs> you and I should figure this out. Can we? I, I don't think I have enough followers <laughs> to get 10,000. If anybody wants to follow right. me, I'm, you know, fine, but I don't think I'm going to get to 10,000 Anytime soon. soon. No. Yeah. You have to just learn how to put on makeup or be a hauler. You can start doing hauls. No? Right. No. <laughs> We'll just stick with this, All right. uh, I think, for now. Um, so one of the things we talked about earlier is mm -hmm. this idea. AOL's rolling out 16 new originals this mm -hmm. year. Um, as we went through them, there are some that have sponsors, some that yeah. don't have sponsors. Is that the model going forward, or is it, again, like just finding people for each of these things as you go? Uh, yeah, I mean, actually, we are, we're doing it. The way that we've traditionally done, traditionally done our originals is those are all deficit financed, and we roll out that slate at the new front um, in April. Can you April. explain a little about what that means, the deficit finance? For oh, absolutely. I'm sorry. So that's kind of rain or shine production. Those are all productions that we are, again, kind of like a network we're going to do. We will, we will produce those shows, and we will put those shows on air. Um, as we either start conversations leading up to the new fronts and we do kind of some pre-meetings before the new fronts to kind of gauge interest and talk to brands beforehand um, and see and kind of talk sponsorships at that mm -hmm. point. But those, those are kind of already baked shows and we know that we're gonna produce them. So this last new front, Tech, I believe, sold out completely before the new fronts. Um, and then that's kind of our showcasing those shows where we can have sponsors come on and for, from from the original standpoint, that's all kind of icing on the cake. We, those will be made no matter what. Right. Um, so I believe we have 11 of those 16 that are sold at this point. Um, and so the way that the model has worked up till now is exactly that. We do have some conversations before the new fronts. The new fronts is kind of the unveiling of those shows. And then we go into um, sales from that point. I think that that model may evolve as we move on. I'm actually looking to do more year-round production mm -hmm. because, to be totally honest, launching a bunch of shows in April feels kind of archaic, like the fall TV schedule. Yep. Um, so I think we'll be evolving that a little bit. Um, and at least for our originals, the conversations with brands start once the shows have gone into production, which I think is also something that may evolve for us. Um, we, which, and that puts us in that place where it is very difficult to do integrations because we have a piece of talent that once a show has been baked and created and it's their passion project, to say now we're going to do an integration, that becomes an implied endorsement. So that's one of those things that we just, 
like wanted to have the conversation, wanted, wanted to discuss as well. It's, it's very much something that I want everyone to be aware of. That's, we're not just saying, hey, you can't integrate because we don't like integrations. It's because the, that, that celeb level of talent is a difficult thing to then create integrations with after the fact. And so hence why Brandon can be built in more of a, um, uh, a give and take uh, kind of custom model. And we can, if there are celebs in that po involved at that point, we had Andrew McCarthy that just did a, a show for us um, recently, and I think it was Beyond Boundaries, I think is what it is was. the hair still the same? The hair is still fantastic. Huh. It's incredible. <clears throat> <laughs> um, so yeah, so that is, that's kind of how those things are evolving. And I do, like I said, the, um, we may be changing the model and maybe producing a little bit more year round and having more stuff that becomes available as the, years, as the year goes on, on the original side. Well, it's interesting too because you, you basically have limitless opportunities with channels. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that's always a challenge for networks and broadcasters is there's a limited amount of inventory. There are right. X amount of slots. To bring a new show on, you have to kick an old yes. one off. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think one of the things that's great about this model is you don't have to be tied to, well, Thursday night at 8.30 on CBS is open, so right. we'll create something for that. And by the way, we have to create something for that that fits with the demographic that was before and yeah. after because people are choosing to watch this channel mm -hmm. and, and come to it. It's a little... A little yeah, difficult. it's actually, like I said before, it's been very freeing. As, again, as a creator, it's super exciting to be able to kind of program in a very broad way mm -hmm. um, and be able to go after stories that we love. And we talk about this all the time, and it's authentic voices telling remarkable stories. And that's, I mean, it's a very broad lens to be able to choose from, and, but it just means that we keep our content very, very earnest and, and really our are really speaking to a very true voice. And if that's the true voice of the celebrity or if that's the true voice of, uh, of a story, we're doing our first long form series mm -hmm. this year, a series called Connected, um, that was an Israeli format and not celeb driven at all. So we are, that's a door that we're opening up as well is not necessarily being so tied to um, celeb driven content. And again, kind of speaking like post reality almost, this is, to people who've been in TV and in reality TV for a number of years, this almost kind of harkens back to what reality really was. And like the real world was one of those first moments where they were just, it was actual conversations and you're seeing actual engagement. We're having, we have six cast members in New York that will be um, filming themselves over the course of six months. Mm -hmm. Purely auto autobiographically filmed with little handy cams. Um, and six months worth, worth of footage from these six different people who don't cross paths with each other will go into the edit and then some serious heavy lifting happens and we stitch those stories all together in a way that we really kind of demonstrate how everybody's life is connected and how you may be going through, um, you're making a move and you're buying a new house. I happen to be moving to a new crappy apartment in New York and we stitch those stories together to show that these two people have very connected lives. Um, we're theming this year as family. And so it's giving us a chance to kind of redefine what family means in, in, the, in modern, modern America at the moment. It's all very New York centric through the lens of New York um, and really kind of an authentic gritty story. And that fits within the same lens as our, as our James Franco making a scene because it is, it's this voice. That's a very specific voice, a very earnest voice, James. It's a very different voice, but it's still, it's, that's him. And, it, and it, we, we can do that across all of these originals and play in a lot of different spaces, but um, not be confined to some specific stuff. And from, we do still try to t stick within some verticals, which I think helps as far as, as far as buyers go, trying to say like, listen, we can look at buying something within tech, we can look at buying something within um, parenting or within business, and we have those verticals to choose from but they're all kind of blown up into mm -hmm. more creative, more, they're not your mom tips and tricks, and we can, we can do that within a broad spectrum. So I would imagine one of the other freeing things about working in the digital spaces is something that Kevin Spacey and David Fincher have talked a lot about, about it's difficult when you're developing a show for television because you have to make a pilot which you sort of have to tell enough of the story to get yeah. people in yeah. and then if it doesn't work, you, you know, the show can get canceled and mm -hmm. it, it makes it difficult because you can't lay out the story architecture the way that you want. Right. And there's, there's a double-edged sword to that. I think it gives you the freedom to create that storyline in the way that you want, but mm -hmm. the way that the networks have done it for years has actually worked pretty well right. for, for most of those shows. So it, it's interesting, the, the different thing. The other thing that um, I would love to get your opinion mm -hmm. on is the idea of uh, 
not just that, but the idea of binge watching uh, yeah. versus being able to segment things out in a time frame that is comfortable for you as the content producer. Yeah, it's actually been very interesting and we experimented with this a lot and did a lot of, um, really kind of came into it as a let's keep an open mind about it and as much as there was a lot of talk of binge viewing and releasing entire seasons at one right. time and it was kind of in vogue for a minute, we've learned and actually kind of <laughs> feel like the content, not only does with it, within my slate and within everything we do, content dictate the length of our, I'm sorry, story dictate the length of our content, we really have realized that the, your, your release strategy should be matched with the content. Mm -hmm. Shows like Candidly Nicole are great for a weekly release and they are great for, I digest this one funny piece of content, we promote through the week for the next one, and that's as close as we get to kind of appointment viewing, and it works really well for a show like that. They're, they're encapsulated, self-contained episodes. When you get into much more story-driven stuff, right. you do want to sit down and consume for a, a story arc, essentially, within four episodes or within 10 episodes, and so I think that there are more story arc driven shows and more serialized shows that lend themselves to binge viewing, mm -hmm. and we've been doing that. We've experimented with breaking them into four episode releases at a time, um, and we will still continue to do some full on batch releases and do an entire season of 10 or 12 episodes, which we did some last year. We'll be doing that with City Ballet with Sarah Jessica Parker's documentary um, this year as well. It's funny, I find myself trying to ration out a new show, like House of Cards come on and I want to watch it, right. but my wife always wants to watch one more and I'm sitting there going, we're, we're, we're going to have to wait 14 months the for the next one, let's just space this out a little bit. You're very well, my, well me measured. And my daughter never watched Lost when she was a kid and then when after her first year of college she came home one weekend and was just trying to relax after finals and she sat down fired up Hulu on her laptop, mm -hmm. laid in her bed, and watched Lost seven seasons uh -huh. for the next like yeah. three days. By the way, it's a lot less confusing yeah. when you watch it that way. <laughs> um, was she devastated at the end, like in This Is 40? I, you know, it's funny. She was crushed. I know, that's yeah. so funny. But she, uh, she loved it, but it was interesting because she consumed it all at once. Mm -hmm. You don't forget, yeah. oh yeah, that thing, that guy, that mm -hmm. person that died, it, it was uh, a very interesting way, but. Yeah. Uh, it, it definitely is different, different patterns. And I think one of the things that came up in conversations yesterday is there are going to be some people who want to binge, there are going to be other yeah. people who want to watch. Uh, and, and I hope that the model evolves so that those shows where it makes sense, mm -hmm. you do that, and the yeah. shows where it doesn't. I think, yeah, you can get you value don't. out of both models, so. Um, so one of the things that this audience is always uh, interested in is how can they be better mm. at doing branded content. What makes for a good client relationship or a good agency relationship right. from the point of view of a content developer? Yeah, I mean, honestly, like I said, like I was starting to talk about earlier, I think the biggest thing that we value and I think that makes for much better content is <laughs> being the transparency from the beginning and sitting down and having conversations and being very specific about, and everybody in the chain being very specific about here's what we want. Unboxing was a great example of kind of sitting down with an unwieldy concept, a seed of a concept, and really saying, okay, listen, what do we want to accomplish here? And it was event, event marketing, and it was a social campaign, and it was all these various pieces. And so once we kind of broke that out and said, here's the absolute must-haves, you can craft something like that. And it was, that was an open and honest conversation from the get-go. I think where it falls flat a lot of times is when there is a disconnect and there is a people feel like that there's that they are further down the chain and there's a back and forth of well wait a minute we really didn't want that but we communicated it wrong and so it is it's been so great to be transparent from the get-go and those have been the most successful ones mm -hmm. and balancing again balancing the content with the messaging and listen what's our messaging that we really want to get across here and finding that on that spectrum of editorial to advertorial to true advertising. And so somewhere in there being really um, cooperative is finding, is finding where that mark is. Um, one of the other things that's interesting, and we didn't, we didn't talk about this before, but mm -hmm. I think one of the things that's interesting about digital video is it's really the, the viewership is much more of a cumulative effect as mm -hmm. opposed to we put something on 9 o'clock on yeah. Thursday night on yeah. NBC. Mm -hmm. We know we got 16 million viewers last yeah. night. You can get 16 million viewers on an online show, but it might trickle over time. I think yep. one of the challenges sometimes for advertisers is a lot of the times we're launching something or we've got a product 
that needs to go out right. on a certain day or time. So it, mm -hmm. it, it's a little bit of a challenge sometimes in, in that way. Oh, absolutely. And I think that that's one thing that um, ideally that I think in, it, we as AOL, not to sell us, but with our distribution network, it's an immediate push out. We have tens of thousands of partners and, and like I said, our O&Os. And so it is, it's an immediate push out. And I think the, 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 it, it is different from TV, and I think there's very much you wake up the next morning and you have your dailies, and you kind of you know, and there's. Um, but I do think that there is just an immediacy to how we deliver content um, that I think is very helpful. Great. Um, we're sort of through the, the topics sure. that we had decided to talk about beforehand, but are, are there other things that? That you've thought of as we've been here? Well, no, and that was one thing I really wanted to show a little piece of tape that I think is one of the things that I'm most proud of in our original slate. Um, we talked a little bit about, yeah. the, to me, what I love about the digital platform that we have is being able to be a little bit edgier. And we are right. um, we freed up in a lot of ways. And so we're doing a show called That's Racist. We're actually exploring the stereotypes behind racist jokes. We start there and then go from there. That would very unlikely to be something you'd see on traditional TV. And Probably not. Yeah. And from the standpoint of, and from scripted to documentary, we're seeing really kind of pushing boundaries. And Orange is the New Black, having one of the first trans characters in it, and Transparent on, I believe it's Hulu, just got renewed for a second season. And so that is something that's really started to open up in the digital space. And we, um, before kind of all this stuff went down, looked into and did started on a series called True Trans mm -hmm. with Laura Jane Grace. She's a um, trans singer, lead singer of the band Against Me. And we kind of tapped into this world. And she had such an amazing story to tell and such amazing voice um, that we shot with her about two months and just launched a new series um, that I'd love to show a piece yeah, of tape on because I'm so proud of it. Thank you. By the time I was 30 years old, I had done everything I'd set out to do. I had taken my band from playing in basements to playing stadiums and arenas. Married, had a kid, had a house, everything you really could ever want. But when it came down to it, that didn't make the dysphoria go away. My earliest memories are of gender dysphoria. I felt lost, alone, confused, and at times like I couldn't survive. It took until I was 31 to publicly come out as a transgender woman. Nothing has been the same since. The coming out was terrifying, of course. If I grew up in a really strict household, their answer was to take me to a therapist and put me in a hospital and try and lock me away. I felt I had no one to talk to. I had no resources to like, go to. I would say I was just pushing it away. I didn't want to accept who I was. I just felt like a guy. I always felt that way. I'm out here searching, and I'm looking for something. And meeting other people, hearing what gender means to them, is what I need right now. I started asking myself, well, would I be happier if I were a woman? And I realized that I wasn't wrong. There's nothing wrong with me. I'm a trans person. I'm not going to pretend to be someone I'm not any longer. You can classify someone as trans, or genderqueer, or whatever you want. But when it comes down to it, they're just people. You know what I think is so funny? I'm so archaic, I call that a piece of tape. <laughs> it's just habit. Yeah, it's habit. But anyway, yeah, that was produced in-house at AOL Studios, and um, it's something we're extremely proud of. And that's, really, that's really a great, powerful. Thank you. It's a great example of kind of really finding those authentic voices. So. Great. Unless you have anything else, I, I think what we'd like to do is invite our attentive audience to ask some questions and, and dig into an actual content developer. So I think we've got microphones around the room. All right. Lisa. Yeah. Uh, first of all, Pete, you and I have worked together way too long because you, you nailed everything I was going to ask him. So <laughs> thank you for that. Um, I really only have two comments and one question. And one is, I encourage you to continue producing year round. Don't do the one time right, only. Right. Yeah. Um, because advertisers are evolving by the month mm -hmm. and as much as your sales team can communicate that to us, those yeah. are more and more opportunities that come up. Um, speaking of sales team, Matt Slan, by the way. Matt Slan, I'd love to know. Yeah, who where's, used to work with us. He's not here, Aww. got in a car accident. Um, you can't so, just drop that, by wait. the way. <laughs> 
<laughs> he's a personal friend. I mean, he's okay. okay. You should just okay. see his okay. eye. I have a picture. Oh, it's too bad. I know. Maybe anyway. go on with the question. <laughs> so, um, what are you? Are you guys also doing pro just plain old product placement? Plain old. I don't mean to make it seem like yeah. it's lesser than. But are you? And does that go as far as to writing advertisers into the scripts of these originals? Well, we're unscripted. Well, so. but there's ways. There's <laughs> always ways. Nothing is ever unscripted. No, I totally understand. Um, there's, we haven't done product placement in our originals. It's not something that we've done. Okay. Um, on our originals, we've really limited to bump-ins. We've done pre-rolls. We've done ancillary content. I think ancillary content, um, and it, ancillary is a, probably a misnomer, some of our additional content for episodes gets as many or more clicks than the actual episodes. And we've found ways to build into that if talent is amenable to it. Here's a piece where brand is directly addressed, brand is integrated. There, there's all kinds of different ways to integrate into actual video content that doesn't have to be in the original episode itself. Um, but where we, again, do the full-on integrations is in our BE, our branded entertainment slate as well. OK. Um... I guess just my last point, and you've touched mm -hmm. on it, and we talked a little bit before you went on, but oh. you know, at the end of the day, this is a transaction, but it's the best form of transaction, but it really is a very sensitive, collaborative, um, you truly build a new team when you're doing yeah. branded content. Mm -hmm. And I think the most successful and then in, in our um, lifetime has been when sales, marketing, production, yeah. client, from, from the beginning Day are one. all together. So mm -hmm. I continue again to encourage you to do yeah. that because that's when they really become the best they could be. Absolutely, and it makes, it, it makes our lives much easier as well. I think that um, I haven't necessarily been tuned into the, the conversations that were happening here about kind of the, the disconnect, but it's just in my experience. The more that we can do that and the more that we can all be on the same page from the get-go, it makes the content better too. So. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Anybody else? Hey, Nate. Hey there. Um, you guys have come a long way from uh, Instant Messenger. Um, <laughs> I knew it was coming. <laughs> but I'm going to send doing, you a CD-ROM later. You, you're, you're doing great things. Um, <laughs> and uh, th this has been impressive. Um, Thanks. Thank you. My, uh, my question for making a scene in particular, I'm looking forward to that. Love, James yeah. Franco. Uh, Verizon Communications is the, the sponsor of that. Did mm -hmm. you guys go out and seek them? Um, or did you send out a an RFP, if you will, or what was the, the thought process between choosing them and and another telecom or versus another vertical? And that on the coattails of Lisa's question, are you going to integrate them into uh, any any of that uh, that show, or what's their role going to be from a that, sponsorship standpoint? Good question. That one came purely out of the, our new fronts. The new fronts is again as much as it's something that uh, we want to kind of grow out of, the New Fronts is a great way to showcase content. And that's also some, one of them that was so edgy that, to be totally honest, in creating our slate, we came up with that one and like, oh my god, we're so excited about this one, but do we even think it's going to sell as an original, as a content creator? And we're like, it's probably going to be a little too edgy. But Verizon, that was something that connected with them. and. Um, and they've been great partners on it. There will, there will not be any integration into actual episodes because his recreations of scenes don't lend themselves to it. And, um, and this one is a good example of it being such a passion project for James um, that there's, there was kind of a no-fly zone with him as far as integration into those scenes. But, um, but yeah, that was an example of content, an original just being such a... Um, such a cool concept and such a high level of high caliber of talent that Verizon came on after our new fronts. Hi, guys. Rick. Hey, thanks very much. Great conversation. Thank you. Um, you know, there's so many channels open for brands to be storytellers. And do you, is there a sense that they're all running towards that opportunity right now. I mean, one of the themes about videonomics is balancing your video investments. Mm -hmm. how do you, but for both of you, how do you, how do you advise marketers today of how to, how to do that? Where's the balance between paid, TV, digital, storytelling? It's a little bit more than I can speak to. I just, the thing that I think has been fascinating is I was about to earlier say how Red Bull is just an amazing, they're doing amazing things with their in-house media company, but I also just saw that, was it Marriott that created their own in-house, they essentially have their own in-house studio to create I, I, I didn't see that. I think, no. you know, 
we talked about this a little bit yesterday in the Creative Media Roundtable. To me, it's always got to be about the audience. Who is the audience you're trying to reach? Where can you find them? And what do you want them to do? If you're trying to get them to act, do, click, do something, you want to reach them in one kind of media or audience. If you're trying to just teach them something or change their perception about your product or brand, you, you reach them in different places. I think I've always been, I've, I've always tried to look at it from the audience and objective point of view, and really, I, you know, there is no great mix. There is no perfect mix. There is what are the best opportunities available given this objective against this audience. And I think one of the things that's great is we're looking at video from the agency point of view and from the client point of view, I believe, very much now as video. And, and a lot of the conversation yesterday was, it's all TV. It kind of is all TV. We, we really are just looking at it and saying, we want to be in front of people with sight, sound, and motion. And there's a lot of different ways to do that now. I think the good news is for digital uh, players is that the broadcast dollars have tended to be where the big budgets were. And it's, it's basically just because the broadcast dollars were the biggest part of every budget coming into this. And every year, digital whittles away, whittles away, and whittles away. And I think one of the things that video does is it really gives us actual good opportunities to get the same thing that we were getting. Uh, you know, newspaper money is almost all dried up. Print money has gotten smaller. But there's still a lot of money in broadcast, and I think that there's still a lot of money that's going to move back and forth to wherever the value is. Who can help us reach that audience most effectively with a good ROI? And you know, the tools that we talked about a little bit yesterday, which are so much better now at attributing where did we get success, where was that um, uh, investment that we made really pay off, and where did it not pay off, uh, is going to help keep moving those dollars back and forth. We've got time for maybe one more question if there's uh, another one out there. If there's not another one out there, then I'm going to say thank you very much to it's Nate. It's a pleasure. Um, thank you, guys.